All right, now my subject matter for this morning is I'm going to be preaching on our appearance. The way we look and, and, the, and the way that we look to others. And a lot of people will say, you know, well, God doesn't care about that. Why do you think God cares about the way that I'm dressed? Or you think God cares about the way my hair is? Or do you think my God cares about these things? And a lot of people will say, no, God doesn't care about that because all God ever looks at is your heart. And I'm here to tell you this morning, that's not true. Now, look, the heart is the most important thing. And I'm going to get into this a little bit later. We're going to cover some scripture about this. What's on the inside is way more important. It is vastly more important than what's on the outside. That is a true statement. But that does not mean that the outside doesn't matter at all. And we're going to look. There's lots of reasons for this. And basically what we're going to be doing is looking at Scripture. And the bottom line is, if you think that God doesn't care about this stuff, then why does He put it into Scripture? And we started off here with 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to be looking at the first 16 verses of this chapter. God is basically dedicated into how our hair should be, whether, whether you're a man or a woman. And you're going to notice in all of the subjects that I'm going to cover this morning regarding our appearance, you're going to notice the, the distinguishing between the genders, between a male and a female. And this is something that needs to be preached now more than ever in today's gender-bending society. We have people out there now that are, that are somehow confused saying, I don't even know if I'm a man or a woman. You've got these perverts that are saying, oh, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, so I have to have all this surgery to, to change my outward appearance and change my body to reflect my perversion in my heart. And people today, you know, there's, probably, there's always been weirdos and sick people like that in this world. The difference is today people are just accepting of that. Oh, okay. Oh, let's not offend this person. Oh, let's not call them what they are. Just a disgusting, sick pervert. Let's say, you know what? You're right. We're going to open up all the bathrooms and you can just pick and choose whichever one you want. This is how perverted the society has come today, as if this is acceptable, that this is okay to just... There's just no boundaries anymore. What is a man? What is a woman? I don't know. Let's just all look the same. We'll just have a unisex and, and no one will know the difference between a man and a woman. That's where we're headed. That's where we're going. But God draws a very distinct difference. A very distinct difference. Now, what I'm, I'm preaching on this morning also, keep in mind, this gets a lot of people angry. But it shouldn't get you angry. This is something that, that should be so simple. And, and that's why I started off, even in the prayer, if you want to get right with God, if you just want to make sure that you're doing things as close as possible to God, look, we have a lot of sermons. I preach three times a week. We cover a lot of different subjects. Some things are harder to deal with than others. I don't think this should be a hard subject to deal with this morning. What you decide to wear is not a real big deal. How you wear your hair, you know, these, these subjects I would cover, these aren't a big deal to change. These should be very simple. If this is a problem that you have, this is something that you should be able to just be like, boom, I got that taken care of. I got that knocked out. Versus a lot of other things that can be much more difficult to, to get fixed in your life. You know, sometimes there's certain sins that you have that are just, you really struggle with and that's a real hard time. So what I'm, what I'm saying this morning is, you know, if you really have the heart to want to be right with God, let's get these easy things knocked out of the way. Let's just get it taken care of. And, but see, I'm also going to show you that there's an importance for this stuff too. It's not just, it's not just to put on a show. Okay, and we're going to explain this too. This is not just to be like, oh, I'm so spiritual and holy, look at me. Look at me, I'm dressed in a suit, I'm so not, you know, you know I, I'm so upright and outstanding and stuff. It, that's not what it's about. It's just about being right with God for the right reasons. And let's look at, look at, let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 11 here because there's a lot of passages here dedicated to hair length. People say, well, why does God care about how long my hair is? Look, God cares. We're going to see that here. Look at verse number 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Now, in dealing with, with the hair, 
he's also teaching a greater concept, a greater truth. And he starts off just listing it off, saying, you know what, the head of every man is Christ. And when he says the head, he's referring to like your boss, right? He's in charge. He is, he is my head. He is your head. Christ is the boss. He's at the top. And then he says, and the head of the woman is the man. God has ordained, I'm not going to go through the other scriptures that explain this, but the, the husband is the, the, the head of the household. He is the ruler. He is the one in charge. So if you're married, your husband is in charge. If you're a child, your father is in charge. This is the, the structure that God has ordained. He says the head of the woman is the man. The man, the man is the boss. And he says the head of Christ is God. So God is at the ultimate top. And um, it says here now in verse number four, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. So not that difficult to figure out, but this is saying, okay, look, every man, so not a woman, you have a man that's praying or prophesying. He says, if his head is covered, he's dishonoring his head. Now, when it refers to his head, that's not referring to his physical head. He's not saying his, his own skull is, is dishonored. It's referring to the head being Christ, right? He's dishonoring Christ when his head is covered. Now, we're just getting started here, so we say, what do you mean covered? Because there's a lot of people out there these days, and this, this, you know, these subjects have come up recently. That's why I'm preaching on this. There have been people asking questions. I've had people asking questions about the church, and what do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? And there's a group of people that believe that this head covering is referring to an actual garment, like a hat or, or something that you put over your head, right, as opposed to your hair. Now, the Bible is, I, with people that believe this doctrine, I honestly believe, like, I have to think and ask, is this person even saved? Because the spiritual understanding is just completely not there. Now, I know some people may have been brought up a certain way, but... I have to question that, especially if you can go through the verses and just show you how clear it is, if they still just reject that. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to make fun of people or anything, but it's just, it's just true. When we see these verses that explicitly say, like, just jump down to... Um, oh, where is it? Yeah, 15. Thank you. Verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory for, to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. So as we read this passage, you're going to see his head being covered, her head not being covered, and things like that. And then in verse 15, it, it explicitly just says her hair is given her for a covering. The covering that we've just been talking about and the fact that they've been talking about long hair and short hair throughout this passage, it explicitly just says, look, her hair is given her for a covering. That is the covering we're referring to. We're not referring to a hat. We're not referring to a garment that's never mentioned once in the passage. The covering literally is the hair. But let's, let's go back up here. Because there are people that, that cling to that doctrine and it doesn't make any sense to me at all. I don't see how you can get that from this passage when you read the whole thing in context. Now, so it says here that every man praying or prophesying having his, his head covered dishonoreth his head, meaning Christ. Verse 5, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. And who is the head of the woman? It's the man. Right? So the Bible is saying that, that every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now I'll ask you this. Even in today's society, would you consider it a shame for a woman to be completely bald and just shaved, shorn, just, just nothing on their head? Now, I know that there are women out there, especially people dealing with cancer and they go through chemotherapy and this happens. But when that happens, don't you normally see them putting something, uh, some other extra covering on their head because they're embarrassed, because they don't feel right, they, don't, you know, they know they don't look right with, with their hair being completely shaved off. And when you see some weirdo like Sinead O'Connor or something, you're just like, man, that's a shame. And it just looks weird. And you know that that's not right for a woman to have her head just completely shane or shorn. So the Bible is saying here, and, and even, in, even today, and I don't believe in society rules that culture dictates what's right and what's wrong. 
I believe that God has a very clear idea of right and wrong, and he spells it out for us in the Bible, and that just because a whole group of people or a nation or a city decide, you know what, we're actually okay with this. I actually like this. I think this is good. Just because everybody around you may think a certain way doesn't mean that that's right or good. God determines what's right and wrong. And we have to look to the Bible for that. And, and again, the way that we look and the way that we appear to others, whether it be clothing, whether it be our hair, things like that, people are going to say, oh, well, that changes with the times and what's right and wrong. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. God has determined what is right and what is wrong. And he's saying here that if it's a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, then let her be covered. Let her, have, you know, let her head be covered. Verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. So he's saying the reason why that man should not have long hair, should not have his head covered, is because he's the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. So if we're, if we're here created as men, created in the image of God, and we're not supposed to have long hair because he says that's what we're creating in his image. Does that mean that God has long hair? No, of course not. God does not. So when you see these pictures of Jesus Christ, right, that was made popular by a sodomite with the real long flowing hair and he just has this real passive look on his face and, and this, this big teddy bear with long hair, that's not Jesus. That's actually dishonoring to God. Because Jesus Christ did not have long hair. And we could, we could know that for a fact from this passage that men, and in even God's image, does not, is not someone that has long hair. Verse number 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. I want to show us, you know, he's saying, well, he's talking about the hair length. Now, why is he going back to talking about you know, man and woman and explaining that, the, you know, the, the man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man. He's emphasizing the role and, and the position that women have versus men. And I think the reason why this comes up multiple times in the Bible is because sometimes it may be hard to deal with and, and societies will try to tell you that, you know, men and women should have the same role and, and anything a man can do, a woman can do and anything a woman can do, a man can do. And they try to make this equality that that's doesn't exist. Now, what I want to point out is people look at this and say, oh man, you're down on women and everything else. No, I love women. I married one. Okay? I decided to spend the rest of my life with one. I love them so much. But it does nothing to do with the value of the person at all. It just has to do with how God designed you and where he wants you to be. Now, do you care where God wants you doing with your life? I sure do. I care what God wants me to do with my life. And if you do too, you have to be able to swallow your own pride maybe and not have to be so influenced by what this world is going to tell you and not get so upset when the world's like, oh man, I can't believe that. What, you stay at home? You don't go out and work? And people give you a hard time about that. No, I, actually I don't because I'm more concerned about what God has for me to do than what you want me to do. Amen. And he's saying here, look, the man was not created for the woman. And that goes, that's true. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. God first formed man in his image when he created Adam. And then he said, hey, it's not good that the man should be alone. I'm going to make a help meet for him, a help that's suitable for him to help him in his business and do the things that I want him to do. So God brings all these animals around, but you know what? All that creation, all those animals, none of them are good enough. It's not suitable. It's not a help meet for him. And then he finally created woman out of man when he took Adam's rib and he formed Eve and created woman and said, now, you know, he's like, now this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And, you know, and he loved her. And God said, for this reason shall man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. And that was the perfect help meet for Adam. And there are lots of great helps that is, that is a job of a woman for her husband to do. A lot of support, a lot of strength, a lot of, a lot of things that are done, and none of them are demeaning or hold low value. But as I'm going to get into tonight, in order to get a lot of things done, 
You know, we need to have a team. And when you have a partnership, you know, you're going to get a lot more done with your life and, and, and just in general for God. If my wife wasn't here, I wouldn't be able to do as much work for God as I can do. She is a, a big support for that, to get a lot of other things done around here to help and to teach the children, which is extremely important. One of the most important jobs in the world is teaching our children and the amount of time that she spends with them to make sure that they grow up and they love the Lord and everything else. I mean, there, there's so many reasons why this makes sense. Besides the fact that it just comes from the Bible and that this is what the Bible's saying. And he's explaining this, that the man is not the woman, the woman of the man. And then he says, um, well, hold on a second before I even get into that. When a woman does not have her head covered, she's dishonoring the man. And this goes back and forth to the role that a man and a woman have and how it's represented on their head. And it's interesting to me when just through observation I see the woman with the real short hair dressed like a man wearing the pants and the whole nine and then I see the way that she treats her husband nine out of ten times it's not with respect. It's not with the with the role that she's been given in, in her duty as a, as a wife, but it's more like a boss. It's this usurping of authority. And isn't it interesting? I mean, when you look at CEOs of company that are women, when you look at women in, in, in high positions of power, of authority, I mean, look at the, the women that run for president. It's, they all have their hair cut real short. It's, it's, it's symbolic, yes. Now, is that the case with every single woman? No, it's not. And I'm not trying to say that it is. But a lot of this is symbolic of that position and of that power. And cutting that hair short is trying to show that, you know what, I'm trying to be like the man. I'm trying to be the one in charge. I want to be the head. And you dishonor your true head, which is the man as a woman, when you cut your hair short. And you dishonor God. And, and a man, likewise, look, I've been talking a lot about, I've been mentioning the women quite a bit, but the man that grows his hair long and just has this long hair so he looks like a woman, and how embarrassing is that for a guy to be walking down the street with his real long hair and someone's behind him going, hey, ma'am, hold on a second. He turns around. It's like, oh, oops. So, yeah, well, maybe you shouldn't have your hair like a woman if you don't want to be mistaken for a woman. Okay, and that's dishonoring unto God. And, and we, should, we ought to treat this seriously. Like he created you in his image. Don't veer off from that. Don't be rebellious. Say, oh, I don't want to look like that. Oh, and then people have the long hair. And look, I, I used to have long hair because I was stupid and brainwashed by society back in the 80s when mullets were pop popular. You know, yes, I had one. Okay. This is Mullets Anonymous, and, and I am... <laughs> telling you that I had that. But it was stupid and foolish and all it was is because I was following the ways of the world. Whatever the world said was cool or popular or whatever I did and it was this, this. And you know what? It was tied also in the rebellion of rock and roll because I was really big into music. I love the heavy metal. I love the rock. I love all this stuff. And you know what they did? They all had the really long hair. And you know why? Because it was rebellious. Even going back to like the 60s and 70s, right? There were certain bands like the Beach Boys and even the Beatles were talking, you know, people, society would look at that and say, oh, these were good guys. These, these were the nice, clean cut guys. But then you start having these other rock bands, these long hairs, right? And, and you know what? Praise the Lord that the society actually used to be like that. We could look at that and be like, that's a shame. What's wrong with you, man? Why are you walking around with long hair and it's just to be rebellious? Because he's dishonoring his head because he has no respect for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they do it. They, have no, they don't care. They're being rebellious against their head. And if look, if you've never heard this before, look and see what the Bible says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and tell me that I'm wrong. Because a lot, a lot of people, when they hear this, especially if they're, if they're guilty of this, be like, well, mate, I, man, I have long hair. 
they want to just be like, but I love God. No, I, you know, I'm not dishonoring my head. No, I wear my hair because of this, because of you know, whatever stupid reason. Don't make excuses. Look at what the Bible says here. It says, look, you're created in the image of God and it's a shame for your head to be covered. Look at... Um, Verse 13, the Bible says, Judge in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Verse 14, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. He's saying even nature tells you this. As an instinct, as, as a child growing up, you can see this, that it's normal for women to have long hair and it's beautiful and it's pretty and it's something that, that's, a, that's something that women like to have versus men having the short hair. I mean, you can see the difference right away. And it doesn't have to be taught that there ought to be a difference between men and women because we're created so differently. There's obviously a difference between men and women and we ought not to try to blend those differences and say, oh yeah, none of this stuff really matters. And definitely, I don't think after reading this chapter you could say, oh, well, God doesn't really care about my hair. God doesn't care if it's long. God doesn't care if it's short. Well, then why did he dedicate all these verses to this subject? And then a lot of people who might still want to have a rebellious heart say, well, well, how long is long? Well, how short is short? I mean, you know, I have, do I have short hair? And people always ask, that, you know, if women, it's like, well, I don't think my hair is short. And it's like, up here, just because it's a little poofy on top. <laughs> it's like, well, my hair is not short. Well, <laughs> okay, you know, and look, I'm not going to tell you a length. That, that it has to be because God doesn't give you that length. And we have to ask yourself is this, what's the attitude that you have about this topic? Are you trying to look to say like, well, I just want to have the very minimum requirement, God. I just, I just want to make sure that I'm not in sin. He doesn't give us that, that length. I think God wants us to have the attitude that says, you know what? He says to have long hair. I don't know exactly how long it is, so I'm just going to make sure that it's long. And it's also a glory that's given unto you. So wouldn't you want to have just a little bit more glory instead of trying to have the minimum amount of that glory possible as a woman, right? And as a man, why, why do you care? Like, why would you care? And I don't get this at all. I mean, with women, I can understand a little bit more because they have a tendency to be more concerned about their appearance and their looks and how they look to other people and stuff like that. But as a guy, really, like, do you care if, if your hair is four inches long or six inches long. Two, like, who cares? Just get yourself a razor. I've got one. I haven't paid for a haircut in probably a decade. It's awesome. You don't have to worry about it. Like once a month, you just go in, you just start shaving the head up. It's great. And I don't think there's any question about whether my hair is short or long. Okay, it doesn't have to be styled. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. I know my beard is getting longer, but, but not my head, right? And that's a whole other topic. <laughs> but this is what God wants. He, the reason why he does, it's a distinction between a man and a woman. They're different. They're different roles. God's created us different, so he wants us to look different. Well, let's move on to our next subject, on our appearance. This one actually doesn't have as much to do with men and women. This kind of applies to both. Because, uh, turn if you would to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. This is a shorter point. I've got three main points I'm going to get into this morning. But we're dealing with our appearance. And does God care about our appearance? Well, I think we've proven beyond a doubt that God does care about our hair. So we ought to just get right with God and, and follow what the scripture says. Even if you don't understand it, I mean, it's what it says. Look at Leviticus 19, verse number 27. The Bible says, You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard, and, you know, it's kind of, this is kind of a difficult verse to understand. You look at it, it's like, say, round the corners of your head. Well, 
I don't have corners, you know, our, 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 we don't have block heads, <laughs> right? So the corners are usually like the edges. And he says also not to mar the corners of thy beard. Like to, to mar would be to, to mess it up, right? It's not just shaving, but he says to mar it. And what I think this is, what I think this is talking about personally, it's just doing weird, stupid things. You know, people write things in their, ha in their hair and, and, and make these weird shapes and designs and, and other things in their hair that draws attention to them and makes you look just different other than just kind of the way that God made you. He's saying, I think he's saying, don't mess with all the, you know, with, with shaping and, and doing all this stuff with your hair. Let it grow the way God made it. You know, get a normal haircut and, and that's what they're saying. But verse, look at verse number 28. He says, You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. So a lot of people today like to get tattoos. Right? And they say, oh, well, this, they have a lot of meaning usually. A lot of, you know, I mean, some people, they have no meaning at all. They're just following the crowd. They're being a sheep. They're just... You know, every, everyone that's cool has a tattoo, so I need to go out and get a tattoo. Oh, the tramp stamp is a popular thing, so I'm going to go out and get one of those. Whatever it is, you know, people go out and do this stuff. Some people, though, they're like, no, you know what? This has a lot of meaning to me. I had a friend in college once that, that he got this, this tattoo, and I'm not even going to explain all about it, but he had this, this real deep meaning. It was something that meant a lot to him in his life, and whatever. I mean, I understand people do that, but just because you have all these reasons and it means a lot to you, Again, that doesn't mean that it's right to do. So when we look at the Bible, we look at Leviticus 19.28, it says not to print any marks upon you. I think that's pretty straightforward to say, and look, and he says cuttings in your flesh. Not to make cuttings in your flesh. And when you get a tattoo, you're cutting, they're actually cutting the flesh and inserting the ink into your flesh. You're making a cutting and you're printing marks upon you. And he says not to do that. I am the Lord. Also in... Um, Leviticus 21.5, it basically says the same thing. They shall not make baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. Okay, so twice here we see about the cuttings in the flesh. And again, I'm not saying that these are the biggest things that, that, that God cares about, that he's just like, oh man, I can't believe you did that. And, just, and just, it's, it's just the worst thing in the world. I'm not saying that. And look, if you've already gone and gotten a tattoo, whatever. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. It's already done. It's in the past. But what this is more geared towards is people who haven't done this yet. And just to show you, look, the Bible says not to print any marks upon you. You shouldn't do it. I mean, I have a friend that has Bible verses printed on his arm. You say, well, what could be wrong with that? It's God's word. Well, what could be wrong with that is the Bible says not to print any marks upon you. It doesn't say unless it's scripture. It just says not to do it. So it's, it's not right. And look, and, and people who do this, you know, that guy, he didn't, he didn't realize that, obviously. I mean, you're not going to print scripture on you as a tattoo if you think that it's wrong. You know, I mean, it was just something that was done kind of ignorantly. But obviously we have to move forward. And, and again, okay, look, in church, when people come and visit, when people come and want to be a part of church, just because someone may have a tattoo or if a woman comes in with short hair or whatever, we don't just look down on these people. That's, that's not the point. If, if that's what you think the point is, you're completely missing it. And I actually, I don't want to see that happen here. I better not find out that that's happening where people are coming in and being, you know, this judgmental, holier-than-thou type of attitude where people come in that they have a problem. Because look, everybody has a different problem. Everybody has sin. Some people is a little bit more obvious or apparent than others, but just because you may have a certain knowledge about something and maybe they don't, and maybe they never even heard about it before, doesn't mean that you should just be looking down on that person. Okay? We need to, to be able to have an openness and acceptance to a, to a degree, obviously. You know, we're not just going to let complete perverts in our church either. But, um, you know, the point isn't, to, isn't to, to browbeat them or anything like that. The point is just to get right with God, okay? We need to just not look at this stuff as, as if it's, you know, because it shouldn't offend you anyways. Now, if your wife is going on with short hair, then that should offend you because she's dishonoring you as a husband. But that's about it. I mean, if a woman comes in here with short hair, they're not dishonoring me. I don't have authority over that person as the husband has over a wife. 
So it's, it's not any dishonoring. If someone comes in with tattoos, that's not dishonoring to me. It doesn't, you know, it shouldn't offend me. I am going to preach what the Bible says, but that's, that's where that's going to, that's going to end. And I'm trying to show you here just these different scriptures that God, you know what, there are some scriptures here. Now look, those are only a couple verses about, about the printing marks on your body. It's not talked about over and over and over again. This isn't the most important thing. But it is in the Bible. God did take the time to put it in his word. That is one of his laws. And all of God's laws are important. So we're going to cover that and we're just like everything else. Turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 16. This is a good time to get into this point about, um, you know, God looking on our hearts. Because he does look on our hearts. And that, and that is the most important thing. And I'm trying not to lose focus of that either as we go over these these issues, but you can't just throw that out there as an excuse to say, well, everything's just fine. God doesn't care about any of this stuff. In 1 Samuel 16, we see the story of Samuel and how God was replacing Saul as king. God didn't want Saul. Now, Saul was chosen as king. When Saul was chosen, all the people were like, wow, this is the king because the Bible says that he was head and shoulders above every man. So he was this tall guy, right? And when people look at him, you could be like, wow, I could see, you know, carnally speaking in their flesh, they could be thinking like, I can see why God chose this man because he's, he's a taller than everyone. He's got strength. You know, he's going to be a mighty man of war. And if you remember, that's why the people wanted a king in the first place was to go out and protect them and fight their battles for them and to lead them. That's what they wanted. But that's not the real reason why God chose Saul. God chose Saul because he was little in his own eyes. He was humble. And, and if you remember, when they, were, when they were looking for him, when they were anointing him king, he was hidden among the stuff. He didn't even want to like come out. He was kind of, I don't want to say embarrassed, but you know, he, he didn't, he didn't want to be the center of attention. He was real meek. And that is why God chose him. But Saul's heart changed when he got in that position. And Saul rebelled against God, and he thought that he was doing right even when he was singing. And, and even when he was rebuked, by the man of God. He still had this rebellious heart and attitude saying, well, I, I didn't do what was wrong. I'm doing what's right. And God, you know, took away his kingship because of that. And God, and here is where um, Samuel is going to anoint the next, who's going to be the next king, which is David. Look at verse number one of 1 Samuel 16. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn, wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So when he sees Jesse's son Eliab, he's thinking like, Wow, this must be the man that God has anointed to be the next king over Israel. Just by looking at him, he's just thinking like, This must be the next king. Look at verse number 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance. That's on his face, on the way that he looks. Don't look at the way he looks or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now, great verse. I mean, this is saying, look, God doesn't look on your outward appearance. God's looking on your heart. But what is the context? You can't just take this verse and say, well, this negates 1 Corinthians 11. This negates Leviticus. This negates those other laws that God says he does care about this stuff, right? You can't just say, well, God doesn't look on the outward appearance. You know when God doesn't look on the outward appearance? When he's choosing a leader. When he's choosing a kid, he's saying, I'm looking at the more important thing, which is on the heart. In this instance, the attributes that mattered most aren't the outward appearance. I mean, what if, what if David were to have a tattoo, right? What does that mean? It just means he made a mistake in his life. 
But is that just going to be like, well, now you can't, you can't be king over Israel. God's not looking at that to, deter, to make that judgment call. What he is looking at, though, is the heart. And he's saying, I want someone who loves me and who's going to obey me and who's going to be you know, um, committed to, to following my words and being an upright and a man of integrity and a meek man and a humble man in order to lead this people. That's what he's looking at and that's why he's looking at the heart because you can't get that from the outward appearance. However, another important thing to take from this is it says, look, man looketh on the outward appearance. Now, should we only be concerned with what man thinks about us? No. But is it something that we should consider that man does look on the outward appearance? Yeah, I believe it should because as Christians, what we want to do is convince other people to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be effective at sowing. We want to be effective at convincing people, hey, this is right, this is true. And when you go out and you have a poor testimony and you have this, this poor outward appearance that is contrary to what the Scripture says, that is going to have an impact on the way people think about you and it's going to have an impact on how much work you can do for God. Man does look on the outward appearance. It does make a difference. For example, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I wear a suit every time we have church, every single time I get behind this pulpit. Why? There's many reasons why. One is because I consider this job extremely important. I think this is a, a very important position to have, and I don't treat it as nothing. I don't treat it as if, you know, I'm going to the beach for example, and I'm just taking a day off. No, I'm working and I'm working hard. And it's just the way people are. You look at the, out, the outward appearance. You know, this is a position that ought, to, that ought to have respect. Now look, respect is earned. It shouldn't just be given, you know, just freely. But in this position ought to be a man filling it that is worthy of respect. And the way that you present yourself it's going to have a big influence on that and even just the things that you wear. Um, you know, if I, if I were to go to someone else's wedding, right, you were invited to a wedding, and I were to show up in flip-flops and shorts and a tank top, right, just, just real, hey, how's it going? Maybe a wife beater and, you know, in shorts and flip-flops, right? Just show up looking like that. Is it going to be offensive to the people who are having a wedding? I would say probably so. Now look, if that was all I had, if those were the only clothing I owned, and you know, I'm not rich, I'm poor, I have just one shirt and one, you know, like this is what I have, are they going to be offended? No. No. I don't, I don't believe that at all. But if that's not all you have, and look, I believe church is the same way. Church is important. We're coming here to worship and to serve God and to learn and to come together. I think church is important. I've always dressed up to come to church. Why? Because I think it's important. Because I put a level of importance on it. I mean, I dress up to go to someone's wedding. I dress up to go to a job interview. I dress up for other things because they're important. It's just a level of importance. So that's why I do these things, right? And that's why I think, you know, people should because also, you know, men are looking at the outward appearance as well. And this is a serious job and, and I have respect for God and I want to have God pleased with me and let him know that, hey, this may be a minor thing, you know, the, the clothing that's on my body, but I want God to be happy with it completely. I don't want there to be a little, well, you know, at least he's here type of nature. I want, I want God to be pleased with, with, with every aspect of my life. Now, um, turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 7. And I'm just going to read for you from Matthew 23 because there's another... Um, scripture in Matthew 23 regarding our outward appearance. When Jesus is rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees and calling them hypocrites, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. And, you know, when he's going through this, these rebukings, the Pharisees on the outside, they look pretty good. The people look at them like, wow, they're really holy. Oh, wow, they're, you know, they're such great men of God and, and they look so holy. 
but on the inside they were full of dead men's bones I mean the inside was was just trashed and and full of sin and wickedness and inside they were ravening wolves you know they're wolves in sheep's clothing obviously the important thing is cleaning what's on the inside up he says cleanse first he says look make sure you get that taken care of but he doesn't say because the outside doesn't matter he says that the outside of them may be clean also he says start from the inside because when you start working on the inside it'll work its way out focus on the inside stuff as the most important but look if there's little things that you can just get knocked off and just and just get that taken care of great I say I say just do it let's get it taken care of Proverbs 7 we're gonna go into now I'm gonna finish off the the sermon with just how we dress Look at verse number 7 of Proverbs 7. And beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner. And he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now she is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. And what I'll point out here is in verse 10 where it says, you know, this man, he meets a woman. He sees this woman who has the attire of an harlot. What is attire? It's what you wear. It's her clothing, right? He says, he came across this woman. It doesn't say she was a harlot. It says she was dressed as a harlot. Now, does anyone have any confusion about what a harlot looks like, what a prostitute looks like, what a hooker looks like? I mean, what are some of the attributes that you say? If you were to say someone's dressed like a hooker, what are you going to say that she's probably wearing? Probably not very much, right? Probably has really, really, really short type of a skirt or something to that effect. Something that's really tight to the body, maybe a low-cut top, right? All of the things that would be considered enticing for a man is going to be the way that she's dressed. And I, just, I can't emphasize this. It's not saying that she is a harlot, but she's definitely wearing the attire of a harlot. Now look, you may not be a harlot, but you have to ask yourself, do you wear the attire of a harlot? When you go out, do you want people looking at you and, being, and not knowing the difference of whether or not you're a harlot. And we have a society of children and little kids. I see them, I go outside, we go out, we went out to the 4th of July thing, or whatever, and these little girls are walking around with shorts that barely cover their rear end. And I'm sorry, look, I know they're young and I know they're not a harlot, but they're wearing the attire of a harlot. And this is how their kids are being taught these days. And it's disgusting, I feel so bad for these children that are growing up not even understanding. I mean, they're way too young to even get it. They don't know. They see the icons. They see the, the Miley Cyruses and these, and these other whores of Hollywood and of the music industry on stage wearing almost nothing, wearing their underwear. And they think that's cool and that's what someone who's real popular should look like and they want to mimic that. But it's only going to bring destruction into their lives. Because the way that you dress is going to be the way that people treat you. And if you go around dressed like a harlot, guess how people are going to treat you? They had this thing, this thing that's been going on recently called the, uh, the slut walk. And, I mean, this is just a sign of the times. And what they're doing is they're saying, it's, it's this protest, and I think it started a few years ago or something. I don't know like all the details, but I heard about it where these, these women, these feminazis, are getting all dressed up like hookers, wearing a Tyler of a harlot, and parading down the streets because they're trying to prove a point of saying, and, and their point is re regarding you know, people who get raped and that are dressed like a hooker, and then people saying, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't have dressed that way. And they take issue with this because they say that, well, that excuses the rapist. Look, no one's excusing the rapist. No one is excusing that that is a violation and that's wicked and that that person should be put to death. That violates a woman just and just completely forces her. Okay, we're not disputing that. However, if you're going to walk around 
in enticing, look, these people exist. Rapists are out there. There are wicked people out there. Why would you want to, to provoke that in any way, shape, or, or form? I mean, the, the, you know, these, these feminists try to say, oh, but you should be able to wear whatever you want. Everything. Look, that's not the way the real world works. And if you're going to walk around looking like a slut, they call it the slut walk, then that's how people are going to treat you. What, are you expect not to be treated like a slut when you look like a slut? The Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. All appearance of evil. You say, but I'm not a hooker. I'm not a prostitute. Then don't look like one. Amen. We know what a prostitute looks like. And ladies, you just have to ask yourself, with everything that you wear, with what you're putting on, how close w is what I'm wearing would resemble a harlot? Do you even want to be close to that, to that image? I would hope not. I would hope you have more respect for yourself than to go around looking like a prostitute. Looking like, hey, my body's up for sale. Clothing puts out that image. Depending on what you're wearing, clothing can do that. You shouldn't be naive enough to think that, that men aren't enticed by what you wear. You could say, but I'm wearing a dress. Yeah, but is it completely stuck to your body and you could see in every single curve that you have? The Bible talks a lot about modesty. We're going to get into that in a little bit. But um, turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 22. As we saw with the hair... You know, with, the, with what we wear with our clothing, there's also a difference between men and women. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse number 5. Very simple verse. The Bible reads, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So God has a real simple command here. And he says, look, if you do this, you are an abomination unto God. Abomination is a strong word. Not found very, very frequently in the Bible. It's, it's an extreme hate, right? It's in hatred. It's what abomination is. If someone does something that's abominable, that's something that's hated in God's eyes. And God says, okay, when a woman puts on clothing, when she wears that which pertaineth unto a man, or, and when a man puts on a woman's garment, that is an abomination unto God. You say, well, what is he talking about here? A man's garment, a woman's garment? And as I mentioned earlier, does, is, that, is this determined based on our culture? Do, do you think God's attitude changed? When God made this verse in the Bible, when God spake these words, and in his mind, and what God's thinking, is, is he thinking throughout all time and saying, you know what? This verse is going to change from decade to decade to decade to decade to decade. And whatever the world comes up with, as being a man's garment and a woman's garment, well, that's just going to be the way it is. And, you know, maybe one day if someone says, you know what, there's no such thing as a man's garment or a woman's garment, then I guess this verse will just have no meaning because man has determined it. Does anyone here believe that to be true, that God just has no standard for this and he had nothing in mind when this verse was penned down? Because I don't believe that. I don't believe culture or society gets to dictate what is considered a man's garment or a woman's garment. I think we could find all of our answers in the Bible. Now, common sense ought to teach this too. Because there are truths, just like the Bible said, doth not nature itself even teach you that's a shame for a man to have long hair? This is something that you don't need that much definition on because just as a normal human being given a conscience by God, we, we know we could feel and just know what's right and wrong in general as far as things that are natural versus unnatural. 
Let's start with the women. All right, let's start, excuse me, let's start with the men. A man putting on a woman's garment. Let's start with women's clothing. Or just clothing in general. So if a man were to put on socks, is a man putting on a woman's garment? Because women wear socks too, don't they? Do you think that God is talking about socks when he wrote this verse? He's saying, you know what? Men, if you wear socks, you're putting on a woman's garment. I don't think so. What else do we wear? Shoes. Again, same thing. I, I, don't, I don't think that's what he's talking about. What about a shirt? So women wear shirts, right? Shirt has a, has a neck, has some sleeves. Shirt covers the top part of your body. What is it that's a woman's garment? What if a man were to, were to wear a skirt? Does anyone think that might be a little weird? Anyone might say, wow, that man's dressed like a woman. Yeah, or how about a dress? These are things that are, you know, it, it's silly. It almost seems silly to me that I have to even say these things from behind the pulpit. It should be so easily understood that if you looked at a man, you said, you know, that man's cross-dressing, he's going to be wearing a skirt or a dress. Like, that's what he's going to be wearing. You're not going to say, oh, because he's, he's wearing a pair of women's jeans, he's automatically dressed like a woman. Now, it may look kind of silly or funny if they're real tight on him and look stupid. And, and you know what? I don't think you should be doing that either. But you're not just going to automatically just be like, wow, that man's dressed like a woman. So finding, determining what's a woman's garment is pretty, seems pretty simple, right? That's not difficult. But then the problem comes in when, well, what's a man's garment? I mean, if we've identified skirts and dresses, yeah, you know what? Those only belong to women. Well, what only belongs to a man? Again, is it a coat or a shirt? There's only one thing that I could think of that's going to differentiate, and it's the same symbol that you'll see on the bathroom door. If you want to know the internationally, what's the difference between a man and a woman? They put it on bathroom doors. And the man, you see a man with pants, and you see the woman wearing a dress. And that's the symbol of a man wearing a man's clothing and women wearing women's clothing. When I believe, and we even see this in the Bible. In, um, you can turn to Exodus 28 if you'd like. Now the Bible doesn't use the word pants, but it uses the word breeches. Okay, breeches is an older word for, for pants, right? You're getting too big for your breeches. It's an old expression, but it's just talking about you're getting too big for your pants. And breeches are mentioned five times in the Bible. And I'm not going to go through all five of them, but every single time it's mentioned, it's referring to men wearing them. Never referring to women wearing breeches. But um, in Exodus 28, verse 41, the Bible says, And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them, and consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make them linen breech breeches to cover their nakedness, from the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation, or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place. So that's just one of the mentions of the breeches that were, that were made for the priests. And we see here that the purpose of these was to cover their nakedness. Right? It says, Thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. So what nakedness is he talking about? He says, From the loins, even unto the thighs. The loins is your middle section, unto your thighs, and your thigh extends all the way down to your knee. That's, that's the anatomy, you know, the anatomy lesson. Your thighs go from your loins up here all the way down to your knee. And God considers that nakedness. Now, in Isaiah 47, we we'll basically see the same thing, the same definition for nakedness in the Bible. Isaiah 47, you don't have to turn there if you want to. Verse 1 says, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, 
pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance and I will not meet thee as a man. So he's talking about you know, th this image of, of someone crossing a river. He says, make bare the leg. And then he says, uncover thy thigh. So, so you're lifting up, you're covering all the way to expose your thigh. And then he says, thy nakedness shall be uncovered. So when our thighs are exposed, that's nakedness. Now that goes for a man or for a woman. I mean, in the men, he said to make the britches to, to cover the thighs. So if God considers this to be nakedness, then what do you think God thinks about when you go out in public exposing your thigh? He's going to consider that to be naked. You're exposing your nakedness, and that's considered to be a shame. So when we wear, now this goes for men and women, one of the purposes for clothing is to cover our nakedness. It's not the only purpose, but one of them is to cover that. If you're going out without that being covered, you're naked. And people will say, oh yeah, of course, that's fine. They have a problem with it, but then they have a problem with it when you say, well, what about when you go to the beach? What about when you go to the swimming pool? For some reason, people have this in their head that if, I, if a woman were to go to the, to the grocery store, in underwear, in just, just, just underwear, right? Nothing else. That would be completely inappropriate. You know, women would be covering their children's eyes and people, you know, it's, it would be considered a big shame, right? And people are like, wow, what is this person doing? But if it's called a bathing suit and you go to the beach, everybody's okay with it. No shame, no problem, right? I mean, go ahead and wear your little thong, your little bikini, and, and you know, have all of your thigh exposed with just a little bit covered, and that's fine. Not according to God, not according to the Bible. We need to keep biblical definitions and, and understand, hey, when God says this is nakedness, this is nakedness. And even men, I mean... I remember back back when I was in grammar school and stuff in in the eighties, they would have they used to have these really short shorts like for, for PE. I hated those things. They're always real uncomfortable. It's like, why do we have to have these things so short? You know, I always like wearing the, the longer shorts anyways. And that's I think that's just one of those natural things as well. Like you just feel naked when, when you're just not have anything covered, even up your thighs. And hopefully that's the way you feel about it. But even if you don't feel that way, the Bible does define that as nakedness. So it, it's not okay based on a situation like, oh, well, it's not naked because I'm at the beach. Well, that's just stupidity. Because it's nakedness no matter where you go. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to try to hurry up here. I'm, man, I spent a, lot, a little bit too much time on some of these points. 1 Timothy chapter 2. It's obvious that, man, that, that God has created men and women differently to fulfill different roles. And um, we're going to see here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, um, again, this is more geared towards women. There's, uh, probably overall, there's, there's more regarding the, the, the hair. Well, the hair goes for men and women, right? But it seems like we have more of a problem with the way that the women are being taught in our culture as far as their hair and their clothing and all this other stuff than on the men. The attack hasn't come as hard on the men as it's come on the women. For whatever reason, you know, Satan's been going after the women trying to make them more like men and have convinced a huge group of people even in this country of women that think that in order for them to be valuable, in order for them to have respect, in order for them to be considered having meaning in their life, they have to be more like a man. That thinking in itself is degrading to women. To say that in order for me to have value, I have to be as much like a man as possible is degrading. No, and, and don't miss this point because I think that women should be as much like women as possible. And I think that men should be as much like men as possible. And that's the overall kind of theme of, of our appearance is embracing who God made us to be. Did God make you a woman 
don't try to look like a man. Don't try to act like a man. Don't try to do the things a man does. Look, be feminine. Be a woman. Be the things that God made you to be. And I guarantee you'll be much happier because you're not trying to live a life that God did not lay out for you to do. And men, the same thing. Okay, don't try, <laughs> try to be a woman. Don't be the, the stay-at-home dad. And like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna let my wife's gonna go out and work and I'm gonna take care of the kids and I'm gonna do all this stuff and I'm gonna prepare the meals and I'm gonna do, you know, look. That is not what God made for you to do. That's not your role. That's not your job. And that's, that's starting to come a little bit more into, into play these days. But the only reason that's even become an issue now is because the women have been taught to go out and to get their job and, and to be successful and to do all this other stuff and to leave the kids at home and you're just as good as a man. And it's like, look, it's not about being as good. It's, that's not what you're designed to do. But look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves. Adorn is what you put on. In modest apparel. Now, what does that word modest mean? It means you're not drawing attention to yourself, right? Modest clothing, it's, it's humble. It's not saying, hey, look at me. Hey, look at what I'm wearing. Or, hey, look at my body, right? Modesty is, it can be taken in, in multiple ways, but ultimately it's just a way that people aren't going to be staring at you and looking at you and drawing all of their attention to you. So the way that you dress should be in a modest manner so that you're not attracting all this attention. It says with shamefacedness and sobriety. Sobriety is seriousness. Not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So you're saying don't deck yourself out so fancy so people you're glittering and shimmering and people are like, oh wow, look at all, you know, look at you, look at what you're wearing, look at this. That's not modesty, that's immodest. It says, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. You want to adorn yourself in a way that's going to bring you respect, that people are actually going to respect you as a woman? Do it with good works, not with showing off your body or showing off your goods or how much money you have. It says, with good works. Verse 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And again, we start seeing the differentiation between what God has made men to do versus women to do. Um, I'm going to skip over that. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, the last place I want you to turn today. This, is, this one is in regards to what we are wearing as well. 1 Peter chapter 3, right near the end of the Bible. And notice in these scriptures, we saw with the hair and we're seeing with the dress, there's a contrast between men and women. There's, there's a defining of roles going on here. And all of these things, the way that you appear, I think reflects how well you are accepting God's role in your life. Whether you're a man or a woman. 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, again, what, what they wear, let it not be the outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Now, if you remember when we looked at Proverbs about the attire of a harlot, it went on to say that she's loud. She doesn't keep her feet at home and she's going out in the streets and everything else and getting in everybody's business and she's kind of a loud woman. Well, this is the exact opposite of that. When, when you put on um, an outward adorning, which is, which is really, it says, the, the hidden man of the heart, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. In God's eyes, when a woman has a meek and a quiet spirit, 
and isn't going around and, and telling everybody you know, what they need to be doing and trying to usurp authority over a man, but has a meek and a quiet spirit, that is of great value. That is of great price unto God. God sees that and says, wow, what a virtuous woman. And if we wanted to, we go into Proverbs 31 and go through all the attributes of a virtuous woman as well. But um, look at verse 5. It says, For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. I was going to bring up an example from the Old Testament, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So he brings up the fact that Sarah obeyed Abraham as being an ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, as someone who's a godly woman, of someone who's adorning, was with good works. And Sarah is getting the praise that she so, so rightfully deserves for, for accepting her role as Abraham's husband and, and giving him the honor and respect, respecting her head to the point of calling him Lord giving him a title of respect. Now, of course, Lord doesn't mean like the Lord in heaven, but it's a, it's a word that has a similar meaning where he's basically the boss. He is the Lord. He's the, he's the head. And, and she respects him enough to, to recognize that and verbally say it. And actually, in this case, what he's referring to is in her heart. It's not even out loud. It's not like lip service. She said this in her heart. And... and um, it was what she was thinking inside of herself. That's how much she, she revered her husband. And um, God says that she is a holy woman in the Bible here. Now, I'm going to close with this one point. I think I've mentioned this in another sermon before. But um, just regarding the, the, the dress. Because women seem to get really upset about this. And I know it was, it's, it's, it's always an issue, it seems, when with women who haven't been in church or haven't known this and stuff and, and haven't been taught this, you know, growing up in the world. And I get it because the brainwashing has been deep. But, I mean, it was an issue even with my wife. Okay, when we, when we first got married, and I was like, you're not wearing pants. You're not doing it. Okay? Because of all the scripture in the Bible. And... People, you know, I don't, I don't see why it's so difficult. I really don't. Like, I don't think it's that hard to understand. I think it's more of just this, you want to cling to something because you like it, right? I mean, maybe it's comfortable or whatever for you, but um, you're clinging to something that the world has already brought you up in the wrong way and has, has taught you that this is right. But it hasn't always been that way either. I mean, you look back historically, even just throughout history, even throughout the world, not, not in, you know, Bible believers and in churches and in people who love God and respect God and His commandments, just throughout the world in general, this is something that has been looked on as, yeah, of course, women don't wear pants, men wear pants. This has been throughout history. Now look, you can look back in time and find, you know, hundreds of years ago, something about some women wearing pants somewhere, and I know, there's no, it's not like this is brand new. Things have been going on, but by and large, when you look over time, men and women have dressed differently, and the pants is a big thing. Now, I saw this article years ago, and this is stuck out in my mind. It was this fashion designer had died. I think it was in 2008. So I, I have this, I have some quotes from an article from USA Today that I'm going to read for you from 2008 and they were trying to recognize this man who was a fashion designer and he was known for putting women in pants back in like the 60s or something like this was a big thing and um, the man was a flaming sodomite which, I mean, that probably doesn't surprise you if he's in the fashion industry and all this other stuff. I mean, these guys that do this, all this women's fashion design are usually homos anyways. But, let, I mean, let's just see what this says. I'm going to read some of these quotes. It says this, Ives St. Laurent, and I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but I don't care, changed the way women dress more than they know. The Algerian-born designer who died Sunday at age 71 was the champion of beatnik black pro 
or pop art prints, safari jackets, and peasant skirts, still fashionable decades later, but his most enduring legacy is so pervasive as to seem almost unremarkable. Pants. Saint Laurent's elegant pantsuits broke barriers between the sexes. A sartorial revolution that fit a social one and changed the way generations of women dressed. St. Laurent's signature was taking menswear silhouettes and slimming them down to fit a feminine shape. What he's known for, what, he's best, what, what his big accomplishment in life was, was taking menswear, men's clothing, and just making it to fit a woman. That's what this article is saying. I mean, this is just from someone in the world. He's saying he broke barriers between the sexes. And the way that he did it was getting women to wear pants by making this fashionable, by making this popular. This has been an agenda. This didn't happen overnight. And what's been used is Hollywood. When I was reading in one of these articles, I was talking about like Katherine Hepburn and some of these really older actresses. What they would do is they would do these photo shoots and get pictures of them wearing pants because that wasn't common in society. And in their roles, you'd probably see them wearing a lot of dresses and stuff because the, just in general, the public accepted that because that wasn't as common back in the older days, even in this country. But what they do then is they start and they, they'll start throwing up, oh, well, she's beautiful and she's wearing this. And these other ladies see that and they want to do the same thing. It's a very subtle but very simple brainwashing technique that, that Hollywood induces that people start to see something over and over again. And even though it's not the norm, agendas can get pushed because of the influence of media, because of the influence of the movies, because of these movie stars and people who are looked up with more respect and are more revered and, and people who put more weight in the things that they do. They want to be like them. The, the models, what's being put out in the advertisements. This guy, this sodomite, a God hater, a, 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 a reprobate, someone who's rejected of God, who's burning in hell right now, a pervert, was looking at men's clothing and saying, how can I get women in this? That's how it became popular. And saying, women don't even realize this, that he had such an influence Today, there's so many women out there wearing pants. And look, I don't believe in this one, and this is kind of a little bit separate issue, but that we dress one way when we come to church and then we dress another way when we go home. Look, right is right and wrong is wrong and God sees you all the time. Okay? We're not here in church to put on a show. We're not here to talk a certain way and dress a certain way and act a certain way and then when you go home, Throughout the whole rest of the week, everything's just different. You're just a different person. That's not what this is about. This is not a show. This is not for you just to try to gain respect through other people at church. Amen. This is about you obeying God and doing what's right in His eyes. That is what matters. And, that, and that's, you know what? That's going to be the inside. When you have a heart that's willing to say, if I'm doing something wrong, if I, if I can see in the Bible that this is not right, God, I will change because I want to be right with you. If you have that heart, hey, that's the important part is on the inside. The outside should just follow easily then. This shouldn't even be an issue then. There should, there should be no problem at all when you have that type of a heart and you can say, you know what? I just want everything, you know. And if there's a question or maybe if there's some kind of a doubt, maybe I'm not 100% convinced, but I can start to see what you're saying and I can see these points. If I'm wrong, you know, what's the big deal? And, and I've said this to my family, kind of, it's like, what do you care what my wife wears? Why do you care if, we always, if she always wears a skirt or a dress? What impact does that have to you? But people get irritated and, and angry about that. It bothers them. It bothers them because they're doing something and she's not and it exposes their sin. That's the real reason why. But why should it even matter? Let me think about it. Let's say I'm completely wrong. Let's say I'm 100% wrong for making my wife wear, wear skirts and dresses, which I don't even have to make her. 
Okay, she's choosing to wear what she wears. But I would make her if I had to because I'm the head of the household. But why, like, what is so horrible about that? This is what I don't understand. What, like, what's the big deal? People make such a huge issue out of this. Why even make the big issue? Even if I'm 100% wrong, okay, so she's wearing skirts and dresses. Oh, <gasps> that's horrible. No, no, but I, I, I'm not wrong. And this, you know, the Bible, Levit Deuteronomy does not, it's not just ambiguous. It's not just meaningless. There are garments that pertain to a man and there's garments that pertain to a woman. I don't believe that the world dictates what those are. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, for your clear teaching, dear God. Sometimes, um, you know, the, the world is, is very skillful. The devil is very skillful at, at deception. And for a lot of us who've been raised in the world, like I was, dear Lord, before I got saved, some of these topics might seem foreign. They might sound a little weird at first because the, the culture around us has grown to accept things that are, that are abominations in your sight. God, help us not to, to lose sight of the fact that you do consider cross-dressing an abomination and that there are certain clothes that, that men ought not to be wearing and likewise women ought not to be wearing. God, help us to just have the, the wisdom to know the difference and that we would be pleasing in your sight, dear God, and in every way that we present ourselves in our appearance, dear Lord, that we would be pleasing to you and that we would show the difference, at least in, in, among your people, dear Lord, that we can be a, a, a peculiar people, different, separate from, from this society, and show that we do care about the, the gender distinctions and that we do love the fact that you created men and women and you've created us differently and we're going to embrace each role that you've given us to do because you are a maker and you know what makes us tick and you know that what's going to make us um, most joyful in our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.